I'm Jerry Baker, editor at large with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, for this session uh, of the Milk Institute Asia Summit. Um, looking forward very much to a fascinating discussion uh, on the topic of the United States in 2021 and beyond. And we have two uh, extremely distinguished and extremely, if they won't mind me saying so, very experienced uh, voices to comment on that and to take us through uh, what is likely to be uh, another fascinating and rather challenging year and few years, I'm sure, for the United States and obviously a rather different, perhaps, uh, aspect to the United States and the rest of the world over the next few years. My, the two panelists are, you'll be very familiar with them, Senator Bob Corker, former senator from Tennessee and former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a long and distinguished career uh, in American politics uh, and business, I should say, and it's great to have, uh, to have him. And Richard Haas, uh, equally long and distinguished career in the American foreign policy establishment, served in, uh, I think, at least two Bush administrations. I think I'm right in saying uh, Richard, and of course, is now the uh, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you both. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And I'll get straight in. Let me start um, with um, perhaps what might be considered, perhaps in the circumstances, a slightly counterintuitive question. Um, the last four years, uh, and I'll start with you, if I may, Senator Corker, the last four years have obviously been, it's fair to say, and you've both been very critical of many of the things that President Trump has done over the last few years, so I'm sure you'll you'll uh, you'll uh, embrace this. Um, the last few four years have been a strategic, I think it's fair to say, something of a strategic departure from the United States. Uh, we can say that whether we're enthusiastic or unenthusiastic, unenthusiastic about it. It's been a significant strategic departure for the United States the last four years under President Trump, um, in many ways tearing up much of what the United States foreign policy um, um, aspect for attitude and, and, and approach to the world has been for the last uh, 20 or 30 years at least. President Trump represents a significant departure from that. Obviously, we, we assume a president has and still quite conceded yet, but I think it's most people accept that we have President-elect Biden and Joe Biden will take office on the 20th of January. And Joe Biden is going to come in, presumably with a radically different agenda. He's already said, talked about um, America being back and taking a different view. So we can expect a pretty radical change, I think, uh, beginning on January the 20th. But Senator Corker, let me start with you and ask you, what do you think won't change from the last four years? What, what Whatever one thinks of what President Trump, President Trump's character and personality and some of the things he's done, what has he done, do you think, if anything, that permanently changes the way the U.S. is likely to interact with the world? Well, I think the, the greatest opportunity, and good to be with you, Gerard, uh, the, the greatest opportunity that Trump administration has created is what's happening right now. It's almost a gold rush that's taking place in the Middle East. I mean, this... Unorthodox. I mean, let's face it, the president did what presidents have said they would do for years, but moving the embassy to Jerusalem, doing away with the Iran deal, which created an organizing element, if you will, in that region. And the normalizing of relations that's taking place right now between the Arab countries and Israel is a phenomenal thing that is taking place. And so um, I know that uh, President-elect Biden has talked about uh, renegotiating a deal with Iran. I would just urge them to be very careful uh, to think about that because right now we have something that is so powerful for that region economically, politically. So um, I have to give the Trump administration and Jared Kushner huge compliments uh, for the way that they have handled this and the tremendous opportunities that the Biden administration hopefully uh, will build upon. Thanks, Senator. Richard Haas, um, again, you've been outspokenly critical of the Trump administration, but is there anything you think they got right? I think a few things they got right and will will continue. One is a more skeptical, more wary attitude towards China. And I think that is right. And I think that will, in principle, continue though some of the degrees of emphasis will change. I think a more cooperative relationship with India, that is right, that will continue. Providing lethal arms to Ukraine, I think that was a good uh, decision. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, uh, a good thing that will obviously remain in, in effect, whether it will be new trade agreements or not, remains to be seen. The progress and normalization between Israel and several of its Arab neighbors, obviously a good thing. The question is whether that can be extended. But having said all that, Gerard and Jerry, and it won't come as any surprise to you, I think the list of the things they got wrong is an awful lot longer. 
Okay, well, let's, we'll come on to that, but I do want to very much focus this looking forward, and you can talk about that maybe in the context of what changes. Senator Cork, if I could, if I could come to you. Um, I, when I talk to people around the world, even to some extent, a lot of people in the United States too, but around the world, um, especially in Europe, perhaps less in Asia, but there is a, there's a sense that the Biden administration is something of a kind of a restoration, something of a reversion to the pre-20, the status quo pre-2016. It's very striking, historically speaking, this is the first time since 1980 that a, a, a new president has taken office just four years after his party left office. Um, and I think there are quite high expectations that in many ways Biden will simply, you know, kind of, and Biden served obviously in that last administration in a very senior position, that there'll be Biden is kind of like an Obama, Obama administration mark three. What, what, what do you think, what do you think about that idea? Senator Corker first. Well, yeah, I, I think uh, to a large degree, that's what you're seeing happen. I mean, a number of uh, the, the people that are being appointed to positions and being considered are people that served under the Obama administration. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously we're going to engage in a different way with our NATO allies and allies around the world, which I personally think is a good thing. Um, I don't think the adventurism, uh, if you want to describe it as that, that took place uh, for many, many years, um, I, I don't think that is going to return. I think that is something in the American psyche right now that's pretty concrete. Um, and so I, I don't think there's going to be as much talk about uh, being involved militarily in other countries. But uh, when you say restoration, uh, uh, I think some of that, a lot of that restoration is going to inure to our benefit. Uh, Richard was talking a minute ago about China. One of the things that Trump administration has done is it has ensured that uh, everybody, everybody in our country understands some of the challenges that China is presenting for us. What they did not do a good job of is organizing the world, our friends, those who believe in free enterprise and freedom. Um, we did not do a good job at all of organ. Matter of fact, we didn't do it at all of organizing the world towards that. And I think the steps that Biden can now take coming in and, and, as you mentioned, restoring those relationships can go a long ways towards us collectively doing the things that we need to do to counter some of the things that China is doing that are unacceptable. Richard Haas, I just probably, as you have, I've just finished all 700 pages of uh, Barack Obama's uh, first volume of his memoir, which covers the first couple of years, among other things, first couple of years of his administration. And it is quite interesting on this topic of whether or not of, of, of how different Biden would be from Obama. It's quite striking and, and a reminder as you read that, you go through it, that actually Biden, um, you know, although Biden was a loyal vice president, obviously, and is seen by many as his administration may be seen by many as a kind of a, a continuation or restoration of Obama's. Actually, they differed on a lot of things. They did. But, you know, there were intense disagreements over Afghanistan, as we know, and the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. Um, Joe Biden, I think, was is, uh, and, and Obama talks about this, was much more cautious on some of the Middle Eastern things that uh, the pres that President Obama did. Much more cautious, for example, about, um, you know, getting behind the effort to get rid of Mubarak in Egypt. Much more cautious about committing U.S. forces to Libya. And, of course, most famously, that's most uh, was opposed the raid that uh, killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, and, you know, Joe Biden also has been around in U.S. politics and foreign policy establishment for decades. So what do you think, Richard? How, how much should we see the Biden administration in terms of understanding what the, the same issues that were confronted during the Obama administration and taking the same approach? Or do you think actually Biden could take quite a different tack from uh, the administration that he served in just four years ago? The short answer, Jerry, is a bit of both. I think there will be some continuity in the sense of a embrace of multilateralism, a belief in international institutions, obviously a relationship with allies at the bedrock of American foreign policy. But more broadly, it, it can't be a restoration. It can't be Obama uh, 3.0, if you will, simply because too much has changed in the world. We've already mentioned uh, China. You've got much more evidence of uh, Russian uh, aggression and outlier on this. All of the global challenges have either gotten worse or they've been more exposed from climate change to, to global health. Cyberspace is still uh, unregulated. The North Korean nuclear and missile threat has gotten worse. 
We no longer have, however flawed it was, uh, Iran inside a, a, a diplomatic framework. So for all these reasons, uh, it seems to me the the Obama administration as a reference point is increasing is increasingly limited. And the, the, the Biden administration is going to have to chart its own path. Restoration is simply not going to be adequate uh, to deal with too many of the things that are going to that are going to constitute his inbox. But Senator, you uh, to very briefly talk about the book. Can we talk briefly about the Biden team? Uh, as senators, as, again, as chairman of foreign relations, you would have dealt with a lot of these people. They were around uh, in senior foreign policy roles when you were when you were in Washington, when you were in the Senate. Um, people like Tony Blinken, as secretary, uh, the uh, Biden's nominee for Secretary of State. Um, Jake Sullivan for National Security Advisor, uh, Avril Haines, as you know, we still don't have a pen Pentagon, we still don't have someone for the Pentagon yet. Um, these are familiar figures, again, from uh, the Democratic policy establishment of the last 20 or 30 years or so. But give us a sense, what do you, what do these early nominations tell you about the kind of uh, approach that, the, that, that uh, Joe Biden's likely to take? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, he's obviously brought in people that he knows very, very well. Uh, if you think of that compared to the Trump administration, uh, you know, uh, President President Trump had never met Rex Tillerson when he brought him in as a second. He came, they had one meeting, he brought him in. So there's going to be a, a, a significantly different relationship and certainly a, a lot of trust through years of working together. Uh, both Tony and Jake were, were working for others during that time, and so they were carrying out others' policies. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, as they step up into a different role, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they consider what they consider their own policies to be. But these are people that have been around for a long time. This is uh, uh, going to be more of a standard fare, if you will. Uh, both of them, by the way, were very pleasant to work with. I had a good relationship with them. Uh, we had some constructive uh, things that occurred between us. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a very, very different approach uh, than this, this, last, or this, this current administration has taken. Richard, let me ask you, um, and forgive me for putting it like this, but you know, one criticism that's been made so far of the Biden team is they it is very familiar. They are very establishment, dare I say it, it's been, you know, returned. It was described by some by somebody as the return of the blob, that kind of foreign policy establishment that's more or less gonna you know, run things in or out of office over the last twenty years. Trump kind of came in and disrupted all that. And the criticism is that look, is this are they, have, they really, have they learned anything in the last four years? I mean, you know, there were reasons why Donald Trump was elected and maybe the kind of internationalism that many of these people are associated with, an assertive U.S. role, a sense of American exceptionalism, a big, important U.S. role, perhaps with U.S. military commitments, as Tony Blinken has certainly sort of suggested he's in favor, been in favor of. All. Donald Trump won the election, I think, in part in 2016 because Americans were tired of that kind of aggressive engagement by the United States with the rest of the world. Do you think that maybe that what this team represents is kind of a return to that approach? And do you think that that is something that maybe people should be concerned about? I actually go back to something you mentioned at the beginning in describing President Trump, that I think the, the diplomatic, elegant word you use, that he constituted something of a departure. Well, these people don't. They constitute something of a return. They're really in the, the mainstream of American foreign policy. I'd say stretching back to the Truman administration. They believe in institutions. They believe in American leadership. They believe in alliances. Uh, now, I think over the last 20, 30 years, we've gotten it wrong as a country, either overreaching in places like Iraq and Afghanistan or underreaching uh, Syria and some other places. And I, so the real question to me, Jerry, is whether they've internalized that. And I think they're also constrained by the fact, not just of COVID, but you've got a country that's got very little appetite for large scale involvement in the world. I don't think the country much cares about diplomatic involvement. There, the president will have tremendous latitude, tremendous uh, freedom. But obviously, when it comes to things that are more expensive, above all military force, new large deployments, there they're going to be they're going to be constrained short of really dramatic circumstances that we are seen as having to having to respond to. So I think they're going to have to navigate a, a world that is, uh, on one hand, they'll have considerable freedom. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, thanks to the uh, Trump administration, to get back into various arrangements. But they are going to be constrained. 
by the economic situation, the COVID situation, essentially that there's a domestic, uh, there's pressure to get things right at home before we start looking for a lot of things afield to get involved in. That leads me nicely, to, uh, Senator Corker, to my next question, which is uh, exactly as Richard said, the, the early days of the Biden administration are going to be dominated, obviously, by the continuing challenge of COVID, directly the public health challenge, rolling out the vaccine, dealing with the consequences, obviously, of COVID, but obviously the economic challenges too, and, and, and getting the economy completely back on its feet, back to some sort of recovery. But so setting that aside, if we can, it's like, uh, you know, did you enjoy the, I hope you enjoyed the play, Mrs. Lincoln, but set, 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 once assuming that in a matter of months, perhaps we've got some progress on that. In terms of foreign policy, in terms of strategic priorities, Senator, what should the Biden administration be looking to, and I'll come to Richard asking the same question, what are the two or three immediate foreign policy global priorities that the Biden administration should be looking to deal with? Well, first of all, I think anybody approaching uh, foreign policy after the, let's say, the last 20 years, uh, you know, we need to have a degree of humility. I mean, things have not always turned out exactly the way that we thought they would. I think we've all, as a country, learned a great deal. But, but I can't imagine a more exciting time to be coming in as a new administration to deal with foreign policy. And I mean that. I, I was thinking about this before we uh, began talking uh, today. Just what a great time. I mean, I want to go back to what has happened with Israel, the Arab community, what can come out of that, uh, just the political change, the economic change, uh, the, the opportunities can exist there. That to me is, is just, it's, it's, stark. I mean, it's it's a huge thing for the world to embrace and for us as the leader to embrace. Um, obviously, being able to, to bring our allies together and deal with uh, some of the things that China is doing collectively, how exciting would that be? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great time. It's a great time in foreign policy to bring people together to, to solve that challenge that's going to be with us for many, many years. So, um, I would be approaching this with humility, but I would also be approaching this with tremendous excitement as to the opportunities our nation has to take the lead again with others, uh, to deal with, with the big issues and opportunities that lie before us, the alliance we have with, with India. Um, I just would be extremely excited if I were them to, uh, to, to be embracing the future uh, here in 2021. Richard, uh, what, what are the first, in your view, the first two, three, four major global policy priorities that uh, President Biden should be looking to address? I'd mention a few. Uh, one in the realm of COVID, the international side of it, would be to get the United States to participate in a global effort to manufacture and distribute and pay for the vaccine around the world. I think that would, that would help in, in every uh, front. Secondly, would be to nail down an extension of the soon to expire nuclear arms control uh, agreement with Russia. The last thing we need is a new wave of nuclear competition uh, with Mr. Putin uh, and Russia. Thirdly, as Senator Corker said, I would, I would basically restart, reboot alliances, once again, establish consultations. Uh, and then we could talk about everything uh, from the local geographic challenges of Russia or China or North Korea to global issues, because the countries that happen to be our allies are also going to be our, our best partners over time for dealing with everything from the Internet to, 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 to climate change and, and everything uh, else. So I would probably start uh, again, with, with, with Russia, with, with, with allies, with COVID. You know, if I, uh, and I guess if I had a fourth, I would basically cool it publicly with China. I would dispense with the sort of public speeches that the Secretary of State is so fond of. And instead, I would actually institute a real private strategic dialogue. This is the most important relationship, not just in the next four years, but probably the next 40 years. And the United States and China need to establish some rules of the road figure out where we can maintain the possibility of cooperation. But China's also got to understand what we can't live with, where we're going to push back in the South China Sea or Taiwan or some of their human rights practices. So to reestablishing a serious private channel to China, I would put high on the, on the list. 
Senator, let's talk about China exactly as, as Richard says. Um, when you talk to President-elect Biden's team, um, one of the things they talk about, uh, again, as, as Richard said early on, they kind of, they, they don't, you know, they, 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 they accept that taking a kind of a more, uh, if you like, almost adversarial approach to China is probably inevitable, that, that, that we've, we've, changed, we've moved on from, say, the, the kind of strategic partnership years of the early part of the 21st century, and that the relationship between the US and China is going to be at least competitive and rivalrous, if not directly adversarial. But of course, what they say is, look, the Trump administration has gone about it all the wrong way by being, by turning it in, by, by focusing so much on the bilateral relationship, focusing so much on the economic, in particular on the trade side. And what they say they want to do is they want to bring pressure to bear on China to play by the global rules, whether it's in economics and trade and world security. But they want, they believe they can get a global alliance to do that. They can get Europeans to sign up. They can get the Japanese and other Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries and other Asian countries too, to, to, and that, that will be much more effective. So they favor a multilateral approach to dealing with the same problem that uh, Donald Trump's been dealing with for the last four years. What's your view about that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think this using Section 232 of the Trade Act to willy-nilly go about throwing tariffs around and end up having to send welfare checks to farmers uh, in the Midwest has just been ludicrous. Um, uh, as you know, it's been a it's been more of a personal thing, right? It's been a foreign policy that's been generated between Xi and President uh, President Trump. Uh, and for that reason, it hasn't been near as effective. So I applaud the, and I've said this from day one, I applaud the desire to work with allies to approach this in a more sustainable long-term way. It takes more work. It's much easier to tweet out things and to throw tariffs around and, and uh, you know, be transactional in what you're doing. Uh, much easier to do that. It's much harder to do the other. The one thing I would caution is, Look, uh, China is also a big economic player for many of them. And uh, it's going to be way more difficult, I think, to bring the, it needs to be done. And certainly we need to work with them if we're going to have an effective long-term policy uh, dealing with China. But it's going to be a lot of work because they too are going to be fearful uh, of what that might mean to them economically. And Richard, that's the problem, isn't it? That that it sounds like a, obviously a good idea in practice to get your allies involved and to join with you in, in getting tough on the Chinese. But Senator points out exactly the problem, which is that for many of those countries, European countries in particular, um, you know, their economic dependence on China is growing all the time. Take G Germany as a perfect example. Germany is heavily dependent on China uh, for it, you know, for it, for its uh, capital exports uh, market. Look at what the problems the Trump administration has had over the issue with of Huawei trying to get allies to join it in basically blocking Huawei, the, the major Chinese tech company, from building their 5G networks. Even Britain, Britain, you know, the most temp supposedly dependable ally of the United States, uh, until COVID hit, that is, of course, um, ref, you know, did not, was, was going to allow Huawei um, uh, access to, to build its 5G network. So, and, and again, these European countries are going to be struggling with the consequences of COVID, and they, they look like they're being hit particularly hard economically by COVID and its aftermath. And of course, there's all the countries in Asia who are even more economically dependent on China. So how on earth, given those economic realities, how do you get those countries to join with you in standing up to a China that, frankly, is increasingly vital to their economic way of life? Look, you framed it exactly right. So let me suggest two things. One is all this talk about decoupling is just poppycock. The United States can't decouple from China either individually, but our allies are never going to decouple. If by decouple you mean divorce. What we can set up are limited agreements where there's some separation or to continue the marital metaphor, where there's some visiting privileges. So what we're talking about is not a divorce, but we can imagine certain limits on certain technologies that would go to China. There should be limits there, essentially looking at export controls. And we should be looking at constraints on what China has access to. And that ought to be something that we can work out with others. Second of all, it doesn't only have to be a negative policy. Why can't there be positives? It's one thing to be critical of Huawei and 5G. It'd be nice if we had a serious alternative. And that's the sort of thing the United States, working with European and Asian countries, can do across the board. We can be more competitive. And that involves things we do at home, but things also we do with, with one another. So if we want to take China on in some area, 
I, I would think there's 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 natural avenues of U.S. cooperation with our European and Asia uh, economic uh, partners, also our hemispheric economic partners. So I think we've got to play smart defense against China, be smart in our restrictions, do it with a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. And we've got to also play offense. We've got to think about where we can make ourselves more competitive. Uh, Senator, what about one one area that, that the U.S. could presumably uh, do something which would have this kind of effect would be to join uh, again, to, to, to talk again about joining TPP, about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, President Obama obviously was in favor of that. We know Hillary Clinton, when she was running for president in 2016, uh, opposed that. Um, it's not popular, obviously, with a lot of the key interest groups in the in the Democratic Party, labor unions in particular. Uh, and of course, President Trump was opposed to it completely. But but actually, that's often been seen. Uh, people, you've, you've spoken about this, I think, in the past, Senator, and Richard has too. TPP is actually a strategic as well as an economic partnership of uh, countries you know, other than China that can be used. I mean, obviously, nobody wants to talk about it explicitly in those terms, but but it's a very, very uh, valuable way, or isn't it, of um, embedding the U.S. In, uh, in in that group of countries, in that group of Pacific countries, in a way that helps build them up and can create something of a mate weight to China, particularly as China is going on with its Belt and Road Initiative and various other things. So do you think there's any chance at all that the Biden administration will embrace, will, will entertain that idea? Uh, well, I hope they will. I, I uh, um, you know, obviously politics got a hold of the issue in 2016. It was a missed opportunity for our country uh, to really put uh, allied pressure uh, against some of the things that China was doing and, and to have an alliance that would have made a significant difference. And, you know, earlier Richard was touting the, the trade agreement between Mexico and Canada, which embraced, as you know, Gerard, the, some of the same concepts that uh, TPP embraced. So um, it would be a, a significant step forward if, uh, if the Biden administration can figure out a way, maybe it needs to be crafted slightly differently to take into account some of the more current things that we're dealing with, but to try to rebuild that alliance uh, would be a very powerful step forward. Uh, Senator, let me just quickly say, sorry, yeah, go Richard, sorry, go ahead. No, let me suggest a way to maybe do that, because we're in violent agreement here. I think TPP makes enormous economic sense and makes enormous strategic sense. The idea I've been playing with is in order to build a broader coalition where Democrats would support it, because over recent years, Democrats have moved away from supporting trade agreements, would be something with climate. And I can imagine a TPP that would set certain climate-related standards and saying, you've got to meet them. And if you don't, then there would be some type of uh, uh, friction or you know, tariffs before you could export to this area. And therefore, you'd have a strategic agreement that a lot of Republicans ought to support an economic agreement everyone could support and a climate agreement for progressives could support, that seems to me to potentially have the, the makings of, uh, of something that has real promise. So I would, I, would, I would hope there'd be some effort to move down that road. Senator, I was going to ask you, since we're talk on the topic of domestic politics or constraints on, on a president's uh, foreign policy uh, flexibility, uh, again, you served in the Senate. Um, now, depending on what happens in these Georgia runoffs, um, if the Democrats don't win both of those Georgia Senate runoffs, then um, the Republicans are going to contain, retain control of the Senate. It'll be the first time, I think I'm right in saying, since Grover Cleveland in the late 19th century, that a Democratic president has come in uh, for, for a first term elected with a Republican controlled. Uh, Cong uh, Republican-controlled Senate. Senate obviously has an important role in foreign policy in uh, right. in all kinds of ways, in, in in confirmations, but also in treaties and various other things like that. How much of a concern is that? How much of a constraint is the Senate, is a Republican, a likely possibly Republican-controlled Senate going to be on President Biden's freedom of action to do any of these things? Well, of course, for a, for a for a trade agreement, uh, you know, you, you've got to have, um, I mean, either way, you've got to have a, a bulk of people that are willing to join in. But for, look, domestic economic, obviously, I hope we're going to have at least one Republican senator coming out of Georgia. And I think that that could bode for a, a very smooth sailing period of time. I'm, I'm very hopeful that is going to happen. I'm applauding uh, divided government. Um, so I think, I think uh, obviously, it's going to constrain 
some of the things domestically that a Biden administration may wish to do. It'll it may constrain uh, them as to who they appoint. Uh, but look, it's going to be a factor. It's going to be a big factor. And, uh, you know, in his private moments, uh, I'm being somewhat uh, euphemistic. Uh, you know, he's probably, you know, hoping there's going to be a rudder there to keep uh, uh, sort of the more extreme <laughs> pressures, uh, the more extreme pressures from coming. But uh, I think it's going to be, I think it will happen. Uh, I think there will be at least one coming out of Georgia. I, I don't have any insights other than that's what it feels like to me. And uh, I think that's going to be a great thing for our country. And yes, it is going to constrain him, I would say, in very positive ways, especially uh, on some of the tax policies. Let's face it. Uh, uh, I know my, my friends on the other side of the aisle disagree, but this has been an unbelievable economic uh, period of time. And if we could continue this for a period of time, the wages uh, for low income citizens, for minorities, uh, the growth that's taking place uh, hopefully can be sustained. And to me, that is one of the best things that could come out of a, a Republican coming out of Georgia. I said, if I'm just quickly stay with you, um, you know, you've, you've, you've worked with uh, Joe Biden, um, you know, and you've worked obviously with the Republican leadership uh, in yeah. the Senate. Uh, one of the things I think, you know, one of the, if you're looking for a glass half full rather than a glass half empty, view is that, you know, if you do have a Republican controlled Senate, we're going to be back to an unfamiliar period in US politics where things are going to have to get done by persuasion, right? People are going to have to right. persuade them. They're not just going to be able to rely on a majority and a filibuster proof majority or getting away with the filibuster. They're going to have to persuade and there's going to have to be more persuasion perhaps rather than kind of rhetoric and tweeting and kind of angry, you know, self-righteousness perhaps in American politics. And I mean, are you optimistic that me and Joe Biden, you know, Joe Biden, he does yeah. seem to have someone who's built a, built a career to some extent doing that, right? Well, he has. I mean, when the Obama administration would be in a jam, uh, things weren't getting done, who would they send over? They'd send Joe Biden over. Uh, he and, he and uh, McConnell have known each other for years. McConnell was the only Republican senator at Bo Biden's funeral. I mean, they've known each other for a long, long time. Uh, and, but, and for what it's worth, uh, during that period of time, Republican senators trusted Joe Biden. Republican senators were glad that it was Biden that was coming over. And, and here, let me say, you know, the, the thing about the current situation today is the expectations are not realistic. I mean, when you begin a negotiation, it's like, I, I can use some words that I won't use, but it's just, uh, it, it's, they're not realistic. Whereas with a Biden administration dealing with McConnell, at least they understand what is realistic to be talking about, right? I mean, um, they know how the place works. They, uh, and so there's some stability that comes with that. But let me say this, and, and I've said this in several places, McConnell is a, a, a very effective person. And, you know, whether he likes you or not is not relevant. OK, sure, it'll establish a rapport and sure, you know, they'll understand in a real way what expectations uh, should should exist. But he's still going to be pursuing the policy of his caucus. So um, liking someone is one thing, but they're going to have to come together on policy issues that are really important to both sides of the aisle. But I'm somewhat optimistic that if any two people can do that, uh, those two people can. Richard, back to you. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, quickly on some of these specific issues. On the Middle East, Senator Cork has been pretty complimentary about what the Trump administration has been able to achieve uh, in the Middle East. I know you've been a critic of a lot of what it's done, but but it, it has, has, has it not kind of redefined uh, the, the strategic map of the Middle East, this kind of strongly, uh, in a sense, shifting attention away from the Israel-Palestine uh, tension to the, 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 the large strategic uh, divide, if you like, between between Iran and, on the one side and Israel and some of the Arab countries and achieving these remarkable breakthrough, the Abraham Accords with some of these Arab countries, maybe there may still be more to come. Do you think that has pretty fundamentally changed the strategic picture in the Middle East? I'll get to that in 30 seconds. Let me say one thing that I don't think the, the question of Georgia and the, and the partisanship will have a big impact on foreign policy, in large part because presidents have so much uh, leeway there. The president wants the president Biden wants to do a lot of things diplomatically with allies. He wants to have a strategic dialogue with China. He wants to take forces out of someplace. He wants to sign an agreement. It doesn't have to be a treaty. 
I think what we what we have is a degree of executive primacy in foreign policy, which, for better or worse, gives a president's enormous enormous latitude. So I, I agree with everything the senator was saying, but I think it has a much greater impact on 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 things domestic. Yeah. In terms of the Middle East, look, the the shift away from the centrality of the, of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute has long been uh, long been the case. I think the Iran the axis between Iran and the Sunni states had become the the the, the most uh, important. I, mean, I think the normalization is, is welcome between Israel and Bahrain and UAE. Uh, but the meanwhile, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute hasn't gotten uh, any better, to say the least. And if you want Israel to be a, a, a democratic Jewish state, that that future is more at risk today than it was uh, before any of this. And I think a really inter quite interesting question, Jerry, is what conditions would a Saudi Arabia set vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians if it were to normalize relations with Israel? I would simply say, watch that space. I think that's a really interesting thing. More broadly, um, I don't think we're better off vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So there maybe the senator and I agree. And again, I thought the agreement was flawed in many ways, the short durations and so forth. But right now we've got no framework. Iran is building nuclear material, creating nuclear material. It's raised the levels of uh, enrichment. We've reduced the warning time we would have if Iran were to start getting closer to a nuclear uh, device. So I'm uneasy. I don't like the options. I don't think going back to the old agreement is adequate. Important, part, important parts of it and the nuclear side begin to expire in five years. So I actually think diplomatically, this is gonna be, gonna be one of the bigger and tougher uh, challenges facing the new administration. How do, you, how do you structure what essentially has become unstructured? And you can't, restoration is not the answer, but I don't think what we have now is the answer either. And regime change is a pipe dream. Uh, Richard, just very, very quickly, because I want to come to one final question. Both of you are almost out of time, but you, you, I, I want to—I want to just get your reaction to the to that assassination last week of the Iranian nuclear scientist. Obviously, no one's claimed responsibility. Everybody seems to think it's the Israelis. Uh, what, what's your sense, very briefly, if you would, of, of, of what what if what effect that might have? There was some criticism from Democrats that it was an attempt to kind of undermine the the the, the relationship between the new Biden administration and Iran. What, what, what was your sense of it? Look, in terms of its impact on their nuclear program, it, it obviously hurts it how much I'm not, I simply don't know. I don't think it matters as much as people are saying in terms of the Biden administration. I never thought going back to the 2015 agreement made a whole lot of sense. So to me, the challenge is still, how do you structure things? And I don't think this changes the fundamentals. We're still talking about some degree of sanctions relief, for some degree of constraint, for some degree of of uh, observation of it. So the, I don't think the fundamentals have changed there. And I think there's the one associated question, do you seek a nuclear only agreement or do you seek something broader? That question was there before the assassination, it's there now. Yeah, thank you. All right, final question for both of you. I'll start with you, Senator Corker. Uh, it's the same question for both of you, but uh, as the rest of the world looks at America, you know, we, we started out saying at the beginning, it's been a turbulent, rather, dis rather unusual, unorthodox last four years. But it looks at an America, I think it sees an America that's that, that, that's that's very uncertain and very divided. Uh, we just had an election uh, that was closer than a lot of people expected. Yeah, Joe Biden won the popular vote by a, a reasonably wide margin, but it was very close in the Electoral College. And President Trump got more votes than any Republican candidate has ever got in history. He got almost 48 percent, 47 percent of the vote. Um, you have a divided, probably again, depending on what happens in, in Georgia, divided uh, government with a White House and uh, Democrats and Republican controlled by uh, the Senate controlled by Republicans and a country that continues to be seems to be dogged by this really intense partisanship. And the rest of the world looks at this. You know, and it sees China rising and it sees the way China's dealt with covid, apparently, even though China was responsible for it. And it sees what's going on in the US. It, 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 you know, there is a temptation, I think, to see a country that is. That is it. That is that, that that is that is kind of badly flawed and divided. What, what's your message to the rest of the world about how the U.S. is going to come through the next uh, the, the, this 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 period of domestic political division? Yeah, and if I could, uh, you know, of course, China, you know, is very open about the fact that they think their model of government is the future, and that ours are the past, and they point to these issues to our allies. Look, I uh, I I think that uh, first of all. Um, I, I think that the Biden administration embracing uh, the organization and alliances that we've had for many, many years 
Uh, I think that's an important thing, as we've all said before. Um, I think, though, the difficulties uh, that they're going to have is, uh, is what you're alluding to right now. Well, is, are you really speaking for America? And in four years, uh, is it possible that we're going to be in a very different place? I agree 100% with Richard that so much of what uh, happens in foreign policy is through the executive branch, which makes it frustrating. As chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, you're almost an influencer, right? You're, it's administration carrying things out. But it's also going to give what you just said, Gerard, is going to create difficulties uh, for the Biden administration just doing executive uh, kinds of agreements because they're going to wonder if he's speaking for the country. Uh, and so I think it's going to take time for people to absorb what has occurred uh, and for us all to move together uh, in accord down the road. And Richard, finally to you, Donald Trump looks like he may not be going away, maybe standing in the wings planning to run again in 2024, exactly as Senator Corker says, you know, how does the, how does the U.S. project a united country on the on the world stage? Look, the single best thing we could do is get COVID under control. That would reestablish our reputation for competence. It would allow our economy to get to, to, to come back with its full uh, energy. It would allow us to set an example to the world. That, that, to me, more than anything else, is the prerequisite for so much else. Then we've got to deal with our political divisions. We've got to deal with our racial uh, tensions, with the inequality that coming out of the, the pandemic is actually exacerbated. So we've got, an enorm we've got an enormous agenda, but we've got to get to the agenda. And I think it's through COVID. And until though we show, Jerry, that we can get to the agenda and work some of it well, I think the rest of the world's going to look at us differently. There is no longer the assumption of continuity in American foreign policy. There's no longer the assumption about our predictability or even reliability. That hurts us tremendously if we want to be an influence, we want to be a great power. That's just the fact of life. And until we demonstrate over time that we, we, we've re-earned this reputation for reliability, then I think others will see us differently and they'll always wonder if it happened once, could it happen again? Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fascinating discussion. We could go on for a lot longer, but uh, we've got to draw the line there. I want to thank both of you, uh, Richard Haas, President Count Chairman, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and Bob Corker, former uh, Senate Foreign Relations Chairman. Thank you both indeed for a really, really terrific discussion. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you both.